everyone for this wonderful uh, first creative session and I'd also like to thank Neil, uh, Kajwal and uh, Swati. Uh, and uh, we have a few gifts from our sponsors for the three of you. Uh, on the other side, we are available at the book signing, which is on the left hand of this hall. Mathematically. <laughs> and 
then there was only one thing left to do, and that was to basically throw it off the cliff. Uh, luckily, my agent stepped in, and uh, she said, let me have another look at it. And so I started looking at it again. And uh, what, what happened then was, these three characters I started going around in my mind, and suddenly I saw it, that all of these were really related to each other, and there was this central motif of a triangle in, in the book. Um, and this is something that really fit together very well with what I've been doing. I think uh, someone is going to perhaps mention that, that I've really written three books now, and uh, you know, there, there are three characters, and the three books now are based on uh, Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi. So these three characters don't correspond to them, but there's this idea of a trinity in there. There's also another trinity in, in the book, and that is India, China, and Pakistan. And then once you start looking, there's even more stuff, like uh, Karun is a physicist, she looks at quarks, and quarks actually come in three generations. Uh, so there's all these uh, triangles in there, and uh, that's you know that's that's somehow what actually got me to be able to finish this book. So let me see if I can just flip through the last two uh, images. For some reason, it's okay. This is the Indian cover. It actually uh, came from this this idea that I had, which was uh, okay, which was of pomegranates raining down on the city of Mumbai, uh, just like bombs might. Uh, and so you can see how that transformed to uh, what, what you have uh, as the Indian power. So that's my presentation. Uh, what do you like? Uh, I thought it might be interesting because uh, the book City of Devi is actually structured. It alternates between the viewpoints of two people, of Sarita and of Jazz. Uh, very different characters, very different voices. So I thought maybe we could do sort of a short reading from Saita's sure. point of view now, and then maybe sort of halfway through the session we could kind of look at what jazz is like. Okay, so I'll read something uh, pretty much uh, from close uh, to the beginning. I've just started reading so uh, from this book, so I'm not sure which section works best, so I'll just read a short section uh, from the first chapter. Uh, where Sarita has actually uh, been searching for this pomegranate, she's got the pomegranate, and then the air raid siren goes off, so she takes shelter in the basement of Bombay Hospital. I squat in the dark in the bomb shelter basement of Bombay Hospital. Fingers of sunlight reach out through boarded windows, their tips tracing patterns across the floor. The air in the room is shared by so many people, I wonder if it has any oxygen left to give. The orderlies who guard the staircase door, their nostrils flaring with affected menace each time they exhale. The khaki-clad men standing in a knot, oblivious to the smoke that beauties can create. Who are they? Taxi drivers? Surely are they miss taxis still lying the streets about willing to be hailed? The doctors snoring in their cordoned off chairs, the nurses giggling over old film star magazines, the patients, the ones who have managed to drag themselves down from their rooms anyway, cursing and groaning as they try to accommodate their bodies to the unyielding cement. I listen to their hacks and wheezes and wonder what they are suffering from, what pestilence they empty into my air. Strangely, all I smell is fish. It is not quite the clean fragrance of palm fret, freshly caught when you first slice it, or prawns cold and pink when you pull their shells off. No, this has a whiff of pungency, just this side of rot, the kind that hovers over nameless denizens displayed in the sun too long. I think back to the crush of people that materialized out of the empty streets as if by a magician's trick. Was there a machiwali in the crowd? who managed, like me, to squeeze in past the iron hospital gate and the gesticulating sentry somehow? I look around the room, wondering absurdly if I might make a purchase. Small, misshapen creatures left over in the Machiwali's basket, best disinfected with spices and sterilized in hot oil. But none of the women carries a basket. They stare back at me, housewives, maids, saffron-clad devotees, jewelry-laden socialites. Have they smelled it as well? Are they thinking of Chris Machifrai too? Ever since Karun disappeared, the only way I can distract myself is to think about food. I reminisce about the roasted corn vendors who used to sit along Marine Drive, the shuttered dosa shop down the street, even the McDonald's at Palava that fell victim to the very first bombing raid. 
Puris puff and crisp in my mind as I roll out my daily quota of chapatis made with gritty black market flour. No matter how hard I try though, my thoughts kept, keep returning to Karun. I would gladly forsake all the food in the world, never let it stray past my lips again, if only I could be assured of my reunion with him. Uh, so now that your triptych is complete, it might be kind of appropriate to ask you about your initial conception uh, for the arc of the triptych and how you hit upon this notion of sort of uh, naming these books and basing these books on the these three days. So I mean, the initial book, The Death of Vishnu, uh, came about because there was an actual man named Vishnu who was in my building and he died on the steps. I actually started writing a story called The Death of Vishnu. This is in Bombay? That was in Bombay, in one of the old buildings uh, on Mapensi Road. Um, and while I was taking a writing workshop, the, the instructor said, you know, if you have a title name with, Vish, with, with Vishnu, you have to actually base it somehow connected to the god Vishnu. And I kind of protested, well, like, everyone in India is named after some god or the other. Uh, but, but then I started reading into mythology and you know I got this idea of this man representing Vishnu in this building in some sense. After I finished that book, uh, it just occurred to me, wait a minute, there's three gods in the Hindu Trinity, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. So I could actually have three books. Hmm. And so I you know, sent off an email to my agent that said, I'm going to write three books, a trilogy. And uh, then I thought, well, it's taken me five years to do that. I have no idea what I'm going to write about. Uh, and I told my agent, don't, don't send that to publishers. But she, she came back and said, oh, I'm sorry, but I've already sent it out. Your publishers love the idea, so you are writing a trilogy, whether you like it or not. So after that, after the first book, I had just one word to go with, and that was Shiva. And you know that's what led to the age of Shiva. Uh, and that turned out to be also, like Vishnu was about a snapshot about contemporary times. Shiva turned out to be uh, about the past, about India's um, India after independence, and particularly Mumbai after independence, of Bombay, I would say. And so it made, it made it logical that the final part would be about the future, which is what this book does. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that there's been some equal opportunity employment. Uh, so you know there's now a female deity that's replaced Brahma. Uh, and that actually has precedent in, uh, in uh, scholarly works where people like Manjumdar have pointed out that Brahma was never a successful uh, addition to the Trinity when the various uh, strands of Hinduism were being tied together. Okay, yeah, I understand this sort of this idea of an alternate Trinity of Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi uh, came to you from Devdha Patnaya, he kind of he was talking to you about this and Yeah, and that happened way back in 2000. And that's when I you know, first met him and I said, okay, I'm going to be writing this trilogy. And he said, well, you know, there's this alternative way. And he pointed out the shrines at Jagannath, which usually have two male and one female figure. Uh, and then he said, you know, in terms of the number of people who worship any deity, uh, deity actually wins. Uh, yeah. she's, she's got a lot more temples and worshippers than Brahma. Yeah, and in fact, there is a story in mythology that kind of explains away the lack of temples to Brahma as well. Exactly. But is the logic of you know, is the logic that uh, Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi were the original Trinity, and Brahma was sort of a, a later a substitution? Not really. But what the what the what is true is that there were the three main strands of Hinduism mm -hmm. were Shaivism, Vaishnavism, and Shaktiism. Uh, so and these kind of develop not not entirely independently, but quite separately from each other. And in the post-Vedic period, uh, what Majundar, Majundar says is called synthetic Hinduism. They actually tried to synthesize these three strands together. And that's what eventually led to the religion that we now know. Okay. I want to backtrack a little uh, to something you mentioned in your first answer, uh, which was about uh, this writing workshop you took. Uh, and it's, you know, it's unusual for mathematicians uh, to go out and take writing workshops all over the place. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about how your interest in that came about. What made you take this workshop in the first place? So actually the workshop came uh, a long time after I started writing. I actually started writing when I first became a professor. That was about 83 or 84. And um, I sort of knew that 
you know, I'd seen mathematicians around me. There's one person that I work a lot with who basically just talks mathematics. That's all he does. I didn't want to be like that. Uh, I figured I'd need to do something else. So, uh, so I started writing. Maybe a short story every year or two, nothing much. But it was something that was completely secret. I thought, okay, this is my James Bond existence. You know, I'm, I'm doing this on the side. No one knows about it. It's a secret. And, uh, and it was a big thrill. I got to you know, meet different people, writers. I kept doing this for years. And the workshop only came in 95. So from 83 to 95, I was just sort of working on my craft. I did try to get some things published, and I got you know, 100 rejection letters, which is quite normal. Everyone should uh, expect that. Uh, and so once I started taking, once I got really serious, then I took a workshop with Vikram Chandra, who was uh, in George Washington University at the time. And then I took another workshop with Michael Cunningham, who later won the Pulitzer. And you know these really helped. Uh, like I never had formal training, and these really helped with that. Okay. Um, I'm curious to know where you know, sort of your abiding interest in Hindu mythology came about. I mean, did you did you grow up in a family that was particularly rooted in Hindu myths and Hindu religion? Not really. In fact, uh, you know, the theoretical part of Hinduism was something I didn't know very well growing up. It was never you know you keep hearing about some myths uh, from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, but I didn't really have I didn't know the different incarnations of Vishnu, for instance. Uh, the one thing that I had been exposed to was a book by R.K. Narayan, which I read in the seventh standard, and that was called Gods, Demons, and Others. It's a fascinating book, and what he does is he takes myths and he just twists them a little bit. And, and, and one of them, I actually, the, the myth about Draupadi, I actually used in the Death of Vishnu. I changed her into a sparrow, something like that. So, so I guess there was some precedent. Uh, but then how did you, so your interest, and sort of your, I guess your desire to read more about the epics and about uh, themes that are present in Hindu myth. Did that start concurrent with your writing of uh, the definition? Yes, it had to be. It, it was something I actually had to research. So I went out, I read the Bhagavad Gita, I read the Quran too because it had a Hindu Muslim uh, kind of divide in the book. Yeah. That's something that's happened in all three books. Yeah, in fact, I think uh, you know, your character in the first book, Mr. Dadal, right. uh, sort of espouses this very, in a sense, you know, Dini Rai kind of philosophy, which then shows up again in book three. There's yes. a scholar couple that, right. you know, talk about uh, quite a bit. Right. And so there's this syncretism of Hinduism and, and Islam. Uh, that shows up repeatedly again and again. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious whether that was something that particularly appealed to you when you started doing your research, or was the Akbar philosophy uh, a, a separate way that entered your life? Well, the Akbar philosophy was just something I had learned in, uh, in school. You know, you keep learning subjects like history, and I, I guess many of you would say mathematics, which you figure you'll never use in life. So I thought, okay, I've done all this Indian history, I've memorized all this stuff, let me actually use it somehow. So that's where the awkward philosophy came up. But more than that, uh, I think the Hindu-Muslim divide comes up because of the way I grew up. Um, I grew up in a single room in a large flat. We were paying guests, and so we shared a kitchen, we shared a bathroom, and the twist was that we shared it with three other families, and they were all Muslim, and we were the only Hindus in that. So I guess uh, maybe that's been kind of uh, emblazoned on my mind. Oh, well, that's interesting. In fact, you brought up mathematics, and there's this, uh, I mean, there's an interesting, I wouldn't call it a split, but there's sort of a little tussle that I see in your words, which is sort of, on the one hand, between uh, the rationalism and the logic that you admire as a mathematician, that you stick to in your work. But there's also a certain other abstract, you know, some would say irrational part of mythology and religion uh, of faith in a way. That is, that is difficult to rationalize. It's difficult to sort of constrain within the powers of logic. And I'm wondering whether this split or this tension is something that you experience in yourself. Um, did it come from inside you as a split between science and faith, or is it something that you developed an intellectual fondness for? Uh, certainly, uh, you mentioned Mr. Dilal, that was a character in the first book, and he actually, uh, he's very rational, he's always looking for something beyond that. I think uh, where I was in my life at that time was I was researching Vishnu, so I was reading all these uh, texts like the Bhagavad Gita and so on, and so there were questions that were occurring to me, and I was putting them into Mr. Dilal's mind. Uh, in terms of the split between math and, and writing, uh, one thing that I've discovered is, well, other than, other than the fact that you can't prove that a novel cannot be written, you can't prove that mathematically. Another thing that, that is true, I think, is that in mathematics you always 
interested in complete consistency. But uh, when you come to human beings, to characters, to fiction, you always need to throw in some chaos almost, some sort of noise. You know, things shouldn't be too predictable. Like characters and people, they're not completely consistent. They always go off on tangents and so on. No, but I, I, the math and writing is actually very interesting. We'll come to that later. But it's meant to be math and faith, or science and faith. Uh -huh. And is that something that, in a sense, even you feel you fit in for? I'm curious about your religious sort of faith uh, and whether that that plays in your mind as you go about your daily work decoding the strict logic of mathematics. Uh, actually, uh, I think you know I probably went through various phases. Like I was very religious as a child. My father is very religious. Was very religious. Then I became a complete atheist and said. Um, that, you know, I'm not going to believe in anything. Then I thought that maybe that's too, you know, there's no proof one way or the other, so I became an agnostic. And now I'm probably one of those people who just doesn't want to even think about it. But it's very interesting to be able to have characters think about that. Yeah. So it's a still a very interesting philosophical question, but in the minds of characters. So uh, what what's happened is like, for example, in this book, Karun, his father believes that you know, everything consists of Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi is very religious. Whereas Karun, he thinks that everything uh, is, consists of three generations of parts. So, yeah, that's the it's a different trend. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to jump a little bit to sort of your life as a mathematician. Uh, I was wondering if there was any way, in very non technical terms, for us as an audience at the Literary Festival, whether you could kind of explain to us what you do as a mathematician. Uh, well, I do something called numerical analysis and the kind of two sentence uh, thing and we won't do more than that because there's another section later on on Ramanujan that if you want to learn more, come to that. Uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's uh, basically in engineering there's a lot of problems that boil down to equations that you can't really solve easily. Uh, so you can't solve them by paper and pencil, you need a computer to solve them. And my field helps engineers figure out approximate ways of solving them and uh, tells you what kinds of errors you might make in that. And are there skills from this particular uh, section of mathematics that you think apply to your writing life as well? I think what I just showed uh, the about the decision tree, you know, that kind of thinking. You're trying to break everything down into its components and uh, use them in some way to actually build something else. And, and, and I understand there's, I mean, I guess maybe not a code per se, but there's a there's a tradition in academia that in the US in particular that when you're an academic you focus very much on just the research that you do. And you don't sort of read this James Bond life as writer. I mean, it tells writers to say that they need a James Bond life. But I mean, you know what I mean? I mean you don't yeah. sort of often play the trumpet in the yeah. chest. And you have to be really careful. I was at the TIFR Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and I've also had experiences like this, but at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research I gave a talk on math and fiction. And then afterwards, I was going to meet someone, one of the young researchers, for lunch. And we said, tomorrow. And then he said, oh, not tomorrow, because I have someone coming in to tune my piano. And I said, oh, you play the piano, yeah. And, and you know, he, he does. So as I was leaving, he said, oh, by the way, don't tell anyone in my department that I play the piano. Because he doesn't want people to think that he's wasting his time doing something other than mathematics. And the same message has been repeated to me. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's why the James Bond existence. It's publicity at the Jaipur Literary Festival content. I'm sure everybody knows about it. Everyone knows about Double life. <laughs> but but what's, what's interesting is when the first book was published, uh, the chair of my department and one other professor uh, came out and told me that they're both actors in secret. <laughs> and one of them even said, you know, the death of Vishnu ever becomes a movie, he wants a part in it. <laughs> I love this. This is like a whole new twist of the phrase coming out, academics coming out and saying I actually do other things for fun. Um, I was wondering if maybe we could look at the reading uh, from the jazz character point of view and maybe we could discuss it here maybe a little bit uh, before moving to the audience. Especially. Yeah, so I must warn you, jazz is a free spirit. Uh, it's completely uninhibited and uh, I'm going to read you a section that sort of gives you an idea of his humor uh, but it's also uh, <coughs> Also shows you uh, he he basically likes sex a lot. Is that is that okay for an academic? Is it? I think so. <laughs> we'll find out. I actually I actually am giving a talk on February sixth, the first one in the U.S. at my university, 
And so I gave a copy of my book to the professor organizing it. And just last week, I got a frantic message. Oh, what are you going to do about the sex scenes? You know, I'm going to read on something about that. So I found it known of person. But of course, I will. <laughs> so what's happened is jazz has jazz is somehow a symbol of globalization too, in a way. His uh, parents have been moving around the world. He's lived in all these different countries, and you know he's. he's He's had a problem. He's, he's very unhappy. On his uh, 15th birthday or 14th birthday, he tries to uh, stab himself in the tongue or something. And his parents finally figure that there's something really wrong. He's very unhappy. Uh, so this is what happens after that. Their solution was to move once more. And Jazz is Muslim, I should say. To Mother India this time, which would unscramble my identity, fill my heart with pride in who I was, where I came from. That's how the young and still impressionable Jazz found himself sitting in the green walled annex to the Baikula Mosque in Bombay, fitted with a skull cap and equipped with a Quran. Each evening, as the adults prayed upstairs, I stared at the paint peeling off the benches, trying to tune out the hadiths being explained by the Imam. Could I escape again by piercing some other body part? Fortunately, my cousin Rahim, who attended the same class, had alternative plans for my edification. My parents, ever pressed for time, arranged for me to spend the evenings at his home afterwards. At 16, Rahim not only exceeded me in age, but also in girth. I experienced his weight firsthand each time he sat on me at the end of our wrestling bouts. He insisted we strip down to our underwear like sumo wrestlers. His sweat marked my body, smelling of whatever spice lingered most dominantly from lunch. Rahim's mother had died a decade ago, and his father worked late, so we didn't have to worry about anyone supervising us. Soon we were undressing completely and wrestling in the buff. I'm not sure if my technique improved or if Rahim simply let me, but I started ending up on top more often than not my thighs straddling his hips, my seat pressed into his crotch. Even though I left his hands free, he never pushed me off. One evening, I had the bright idea of slapping him in the face with my penis as we horsed around. He looked at me strangely, then leaned forward and took me in his mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, survivors of the coming October 19th Holocaust or future alien voyagers, this is where my journey takes its most dramatic turn. The before and after the BCNC, the divine revelation that swept away all my baggage from the past. Suddenly I didn't feel hopeless. Suddenly I found myself in control. Suddenly the answers to all my questions popped and burst like fireworks. My identity flashed on. My confidence powered up. The path to my fulfillment in life blazed in the sun. Over the next few weeks, Rahim and I poked and probed and plumped. We matched appendages to orifices in every combination that sprang to our fevered minds. Dispensing with the wrestling, we dove directly each evening into racking up the notches on the bedpost. Not to mention the sofa, the dining table, the kitchen stool, even the telephone stand before it broke. The arduousness of some of our experiments eased appreciably when we discovered the lubrication properties of pantry ingredients. Jam was too sticky. Butter worked better than mayonnaise but nothing rivaled the glissants of pure ghee. My parents couldn't see it stop beaming. How eagerly I trotted off the class every evening, how well their mosque experiment seemed to be working. They even published a paper on this, Therapeutic Self-Affirmative Effects of Religious Instruction on Troubled Youth, soon after. The fact that I'd begun paying attention to my physique was an added bonus. Healthy mind, healthy body, just like the good book says, my father remarked. Each morning he saw me performing calisthenics. In reality, roles had begun to emerge in my after-curricular activity. Clearly, I was the boinker, Rahim, the eternal boinky. If I wanted to fit my emerging self-image, it behooved me to start pumping up. kind of stuff you'll never hear in a session with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> well, one, one of the comments I got was that uh, the next book tour can be sponsored by Dalai Lama. <laughs>
I, I was curious what sort of the primary challenge you faced in uh, writing this book, split between these two points of view, between a woman and a man, a Hindu and a Muslim, a straight woman and a gay man. Uh, this is the first time you've had it, and you haven't done this yeah. first book. So, I mean, what was the sort of foremost challenge with that? Uh, the challenge, one of the big challenges is there's actually four strands of stories going on. There's, uh, there's jazz in the past, jazz in the present, Sarita in the past, Sarita in the present. Uh, so that's, that's four. And then what happens, you know, after, after a certain point. Uh, and of course, uh, there's the third character of Karun who, who never gets a chance to speak. So you have to kind of uh, break up his personality just in terms of, you know, very short words uh, that you hear him in. The, 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 the real challenge was getting these strands to sort of, you know, think of two tapes running simultaneously. You don't want one tape to run out before the other one does. Sure. So they have to keep getting matched. There has to be enough material to keep those strands in motion. Uh, also, sometimes I found that, okay, it's actually jazz who's on the, you know, jazz, the, the action group requires jazz to be on screen, but Sarita is still speaking. So, you know, then you have to switch between them. So, so if you look at the book, uh, the first section of Sarita is five chapters long, then Jazz five chapters. Then uh, Sarita is only two or three chapters, then Jazz two or three chapters. Then Sarita one chapter, Jazz one chapter. So it keeps alternating faster and faster. And that actually helps with the pace as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, that, I mean, that's a good explanation from a plot point of view also. But, right. um, what about from a voice point of view? I mean, critics, uh, the train critics often talk about this quality of voice where you know, in a first person narration, it's true to the character who is narrating. And was it difficult to capture different voices and have them be true to the character? Is that something that emerged naturally for you? The character, the voice of Sarita came uh, right, you know, when I started this book, which was September of 2000. So the first scene you see there is really what I wrote back then. And her voice was pretty established and it went through some changes. Jazz, however, was uh, much more difficult to capture. He was originally uh, a character in the U.S. He was American. He was not as you know carefree and everything. And uh, he was more like Sarita, I guess, since or or Karun even. Uh, so that split came 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 gradually. And once it came though, then then it was just perfect. I, mean, I just knew this character. But you always knew that you wanted to want it. That's how you envisioned the book to start. Yeah, I did. Uh, I wanted these people to be searching for. You know, they have nothing left to lose in some sense, so they're searching for whom they love. And you know, there's this war going on, they figure they're going to die anyway. Yeah. So that's why, you know, what would, what would make them risk, risk everything? You know, they're, they're really putting themselves into danger. Yeah, it's interesting because your narrative technique has gotten more complex. I mean, the first book was written entirely in third person. Right. The second book was a woman narrating her story. And the third person, there's two people narrating their stories in different voices. And it's something, I mean, with, it seems it's just a certain sort of willingness on your part to experiment with what fiction can do and what you can do as a novelist. Yeah, and also there's the, yeah, actually the second book was actually in the second person because she's telling, she's always saying you to Ashwin. Yes. So, yeah. so you know, I, I, it was nice to have third person, second person, first person. Right. So, you know, I've covered all three. I don't think there's a fourth person. So maybe I should just quit. Mathematically speaking, I don't know that's possible. Um, in, the, in the city of Devi, I mean, the city of Devi is set I guess in a dystopian future, uh, where Bombay is living under the, under the threat of nuclear annihilation. Uh, and the future, at least, I mean, apart the nuclear annihilation point apart, the landscape of Bombay in the city as we know it does not seem very different from the landscape of the city as we know it today. I mean, it's not significantly more technologically advanced. It's, you know, so I was, you know, I'd like to ask if this reflects the way the, the way you look at Bombay today. Uh, and whether, you know, it's in a sense converted itself into its own dystopia already compared to the city you knew uh, in your youth. Well, uh, first of all, I should just point out that, you know, it is set in the future, but it could be tomorrow. Exactly. So, yeah. so, so that's very different. Yeah, today. it's not, you know, usually when you write a book on the future, it's about 100 years from now. Right. Which makes it much easier. You know, if it's 100 years from now, all, things, all sorts of things could have happened. Things have stabilized now. Uh, if it's tomorrow, then, you know, when tomorrow comes, which is going to come very soon, yeah. people are going to say, well, you wrote this and this and nothing came through. And you're very careful to avoid chronology, I notice, because, for example, you talk about very recent events, like the right. terrorist attacks in Bombay and the, you know, the Bandra Wadi ceiling being built and right. so on. But you don't say how much, exactly. how far back in the past these events are. Exactly, and, you know, being a mathematician, I take it to some really strange lens because of October 19, I purposely didn't say whether that was a Thursday or a Friday or something. Because someone would look it up 
and see how many years from now that's going to have the show. So I think we'll do that as well. But coming back to your question, actually Vijay uh, Mekate, she is one of my first readers. Uh, she read the book and she said exactly what you said. She's sitting in the first row. She said that, okay, you know, this has already happened. We have kind of destroyed Bombay in so many ways that, you know, there's so much pollution and so much crowding and everything. So, and religious sort of fundamentalism. Religious fundamentalism. Yeah. So, but, but you know, on the other hand, I think any city, especially in India, is going to have all these problems. So, there's always a give and take. And so, you can, you know, it's, it's a question of what the degree is going to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is sort of, uh, because again, Bombay features in all three books. It's all yes, three it's like a character. In a way, it's a one consistent character in all three books. But in the first one, the second one, to a certain extent, there's a certain uh, sense of idealism and a sense of love in Bombay. Uh, I, I get the feeling, and maybe I'm wrong, but I get the feeling that that has upgraded by just the time of the third book. And I'm wondering whether it reflects your experience of Bombay in the recent past. I mean, I know a lot of us who've been in Bombay over the years have kind of become a little disillusioned with the way it works and functions. But you have a much longer, deeper association with this. Right. Uh, I guess I'm not so disillusioned. I think it's more like, okay, you're a kid and you've made this big set out of Lego or something, yeah. and now you're going to just destroy it. So, yeah. you know, here are, the, here are the bombs. Throw the pomegranates yeah. on bombing. So it's more like a fun thing. Right. I don't know, people in Bombay might not think it's fun, but people in Bombay, it's fun. Um, it may not be giving uh, too much away about the city of Delhi to say that there's, in a sense, there's a distillation of the entire cosmic process of creation and destruction, right? I mean, there's a tenuous preservation at the beginning. Uh, then there's a certain destruction. And then there's a, I mean, if not creation, it's a promise of a new creation. Right, right. Um, and this is, in a, I mean, in a sense, it's a very nice coda to the trilogy of the books uh, itself. I, mean, I was wondering whether you saw that as implicit in the book you, the book you wrote when you were writing it, whether it was a conscious part. Well, the one thing that I did see was that Brahma would not work because Brahma is basically, you know, he's so identified with creation. Yeah. Whereas the mother goddess, Devi, you know, she has uh, she has different incarnations, everything from creation to destruction, like Kali is the destroyer, and then you know, art and music and literature, everything. So she really encompasses everything. And I thought that that's what I would need uh, to really get the story, which is, you know, as you said, it goes from one end to the other. Yeah. And, and you know, even thematically speaking, I mean, just to go back, for example, the second book, The Age of Shiva, um, I mean, it's not, the mapping of Shiva as destroyer is not quite as easy onto the plot. It's not sort of The Age of Shiva being a destructive age, right. and it's not, you cannot map it onto the life of the character whose life is destructive. I mean, it's much more complex than that. Yes, and part of the reason is, you know, going back to that first or second workshop that I took with Michael Cunningham, he saw the first two chapters of the first three chapters of the death of Vishnu that I wrote. And uh, one of the things, one of the comments he wrote, I mean, he wrote these comments which were just brilliant. I mean, every single comment was so amazing. One of them was, uh, I see the danger, and you, which you have to avoid, of making this too painfully allegorical. Yeah. So, you know, if you say Vishnu, okay, you don't want him to be, you know, saving someone. Uh, Shiva isn't going to be just destroying everyone that comes from his past. Yeah, sort of one to one magic. Right, exactly. So I think that's the best way fiction works. It shouldn't be so obvious. Yeah. You have to dig underneath. And I think I like my books to be, on the one hand, just plain stories. You read them, you know, they're page turners perhaps, hopefully. You get to the end, hopefully. And you enjoy it, hopefully. But then if you delve inside, there are things hidden in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, that, that's, that's what makes fiction interesting. I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about your next book, which in some interviews you've talked about as a mathematical novel. Right. Uh, but before that, in fact, a former professor of mine once told me about a uh, talk that he used to give in the US, I don't know if you give it anymore, um, actually called the Mathematics of Fiction. Right. So I was wondering whether you could maybe give us a pressy of the elements of that talk, what exactly the talk consisted of. And yeah, sure. The talk actually is a, it, 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 it is, uh, I mean, probably people in here, has anyone heard of Vladimir Prop? ROPP. Okay, so the literature professor, of course, would have heard of it. Uh, he was a Russian. Uh, he was a Russian folklorist or analyzer, you know, linguist. I don't know what you would call him, but he analyzed uh, about a hundred Russian folk tales. And what he found was that all of these folk tales uh, would actually could be decomposed into like 22 plot components. 
And all these plot components came in order, and there were only seven different characters and so on. So this decomposition is uh, very mathematical. And there's actually a complete analog of this in linear algebra, which is something I teach. Uh, and so in this talk, I actually look at the two, two things and how they're similar, how you can give the same information in mathematics or in terms of literature. And they're completely different in terms of what they look like, but we're, we're basically human beings and we have the same tools. Yeah. And, and the next level is going to reflect that in some way, or is that going to be sort of based on mathematics but a different? It's, uh, I mean, that was the original idea, but now it's, uh, it's more a novel, uh, real story. Uh, I'm trying to incorporate some video into it, perhaps, oh, wow. to, make, uh, to make the mathematics easier. And, and the challenge is, of course, to make it accessible to a wide audience. Right. Um, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm going to just quickly ask uh, the audience now to maybe jump in with some questions they may have from audit. I think there are mics floating around, so if you could just play. Good morning, sir. So I have to read this Roberto Carlos's car, about Brahma. Have I read? Roberto Carlos Palazzo's car, car. I have, I have read that. Uh, so it's very interesting to it, Brahma. Yes. yes, and it starts with him blowing out the universe, and then it talks about his relationship it's a huge book. It's very interesting, but it's also very difficult. So yes, I have read that. So and that makes Brahma more suitable for your next book. Maybe my next book. <laughs> my, there's one book. There's one, yeah. Oh, there's one here too. So. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, two questions on the Monday. One is, how long do you write this uh, book about the University of Delhi? The other is, say, so Bombay is, is, is your place, and uh, is it all uh, and the, the portion you read about uh, uh, Paul Frey? Right, right. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is it all lost out? You write it? Okay. Uh, so uh, the first question is how long it took. It took me basically 12 years. Uh, I actually was writing the age of Shiva at the same time. Uh, I actually do a little calculation for the age of Shiva. 63.4 words uh, made it to the printed page in terms of what I wrote every day. So every day I wrote 63.4 words. With the city of Devi, I wrote 69.6 words. So I'm really forging ahead. So that's really good. Uh, in terms of Bombay, how I did, I mean, basically, what I do is I've been going back to Bombay, like, and I call it Bombay and I call it Mumbai too sometimes, like my characters do. I've been going back about three times a year for, for several years. So I've actually been able to absorb a lot. Uh, Sarita makes this walk all the way from the south to the north and actually walk that same thing just to see what was along the way. Uh, writing, 
then I can do mathematics after. So that is the teaching part. If I start with mathematics, forget about the writing. I have to do some writing before I eat breakfast. Otherwise, I get too full and too satisfied, and that's it. I think there's some questions here. Hi. Hi. Uh, I've been waiting for this opportunity because I've read The Age of Shiva and at that time also I had read it and I reviewed the book also. Oh, thank you. And I hope. Yeah. And uh, I remember sending you the link and you kind of responded to it. So anyways, so there was one question which I faced over there also while I read the book. And uh, it's the same question which I face today when I'm reading, the, when you're reading all the excerpts of the book. How do you uh, kind of take that risk of uh, getting that shades of grey into your characters like for the lady protagonist when she stays alone with her son and there are a few instances in the book which are very disturbing for a mother like me who has a growing son and you know I'm a single mother so he's also there we are the only two of us long and there were a few instances in the book which disturbed me a lot and uh, today again you know when you're reading now and here you're taking the name of God, so it's a huge risk. Well, it's a huge risk when you're giving it to the Indian audience. Well, I mean, I think so. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a very nice question. It's a broader theme also in the sense that, you know, what kind of pressure as a novelist do you have? And of course, you have to make your characters uh, identify. You know, people have to be able to identify with them. But what kind of pressure is there to make them like them? Which is, I guess, a different thing. Right. Yeah. So, so let me answer those two questions. In terms of risks, I think authors have to take risks. You know, that's, otherwise you shouldn't be an author. If you're going to write, you know, something that's just going to please everyone, well, that's, that's not what I want to be. So, uh, and, and, you know, these are, all, these are all different facets of humanity. Like in India, for example, we don't talk much about homosexuality. So, you know, it should be talked about. There are many gay people around. I'm a gay person, for instance. So, I, I would like that to be in the arena. Uh, so, so that's that's sort of one question. In terms of likability, you know, what you talk about in terms of the disturbing behavior of the mother and her son. I think what what the most you can do is you can you you have to have have people who are flawed. No one's perfect, so your characters can't be perfect. The most you can do is explain their motivation. Like in that case, uh, Amira was someone whose whole life had been building up to where her son was everything. So she invested all her chances of happiness into him. And so this was like sort of the end of that spectrum. You know, where does that logically lead to? Uh, and you know, there's, there's certainly Oedipal myths and so on that go along with it. So it's not something that has never been discussed. The question here. I spoke about the uh, Russian scholar who analyzed the folklore and the, the, uh, the relationship to mathematics. There are those who uh, hold that it's classical music, for example, Johann Sebastian Bach is nothing but mathematics. Uh, might that uh, be leaving you in your mind to suggest that we are, regardless of genre, we're speaking a universal language that's based on mathematics? Well, uh, that's, you know, that's a leap that I'm uh, not prepared to take, and that's the temptation. Uh, if you actually, supposing you look at Vladimir prop and you say, okay, you know, 32 prop, prop, uh, prop components, well then how do you use that? So, well, there have been uh, examples of computer generated fiction where they might use some of these theories amongst others uh, and they come up with some sort of short stories. But whether you can ever come up with something like Shakespeare, I don't know. Uh, so, so what you can do is still very limited. You know, the, the, the mathematics can get you to a certain point, but then there is something in the whole idea of creativity that at least up to now, we have not been able to unlock. And I suspect that that is unreachable. But that's just my feeling. I'm sure a computer scientist might disagree. What they are many years said behind me about how uh, you're so specific and so real when you write about Bombay. But being, being a person who lives and works in Bombay, where I read, it, everything came as, uh, as a very hard, uh, very real shock, you know. 
And today you're reading about Sarita at the basement of the Bombay Hospital. 24 hours ago, I was there in Bombay Hospital. I mean, my work took me there. So, you know, it says that this is such a weird feeling. And I was going to share something when I read your manuscript of the second book, your, your second book, and um, I finished it. I just began reading it and I finished it, like six hours or something. And then you came it back. Took, it took me a lot longer to write. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's what I want to say. It was like, you came back and I gave it to you and said, Manan, I've done it. I've finished it. Oh my God. And you said, how can you finish something that took me eight years to write? Right, how can right, you finish right. it six well, hours? Well, like you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wish I could. I wish it could be the other way around, or you know, that I could write, knock off a book in six hours, and then you know, you can read it at leisure. But uh, I guess if they do invent that computer program, maybe we'll be able to do that. Or if they need to Yeah, that's that's what I should put on each book. You're only allowed to read 69.6. So if you get to a long work, you can read the first six uh, letters and then leave the other four for next day. Uh, I think we'll take maybe one last question if there is one. Maybe at the back? Is over there? Uh, I mean, that was a great reading. Thank you. Um, to me, I mean, this is, with, with this book I've read all three of the books now. And uh, to me, Jazz, or Jazz, Jazz is your finest character. And a large part of that is, is the language. It's the sheer voice, the exuberance of his voice. In one sentence I remember, he, he uses the pun divinity. Devi and you know, divinity and divinity. Right, right. Uh, so uh, I was just thinking back to something you said earlier about Lewis Carroll and all these mathematicians who have been writers down the years. Do you see yourself you know, inventing words like Jabberwocky and Charlie and James sometime in the future when the numbers get too much? Uh, that's a, that, that's an interesting question. I have, I've never considered it. Uh, jazz is the most freely character. Yeah, so jazz would be the one who would actually make that invention. So it was, you know, I, that's not my natural inclination to play with words. I mean, there's some people who are really good at that. Like someone Rushdie plays with words all the time. Uh, so I've never actually done that before. So it was a great experience to have the character jazz being able to do that. Uh, whether I would take it further, I don't know. If I ever write the Brahma book, uh, you know, it's going to actually tie together all these stories, hopefully. And maybe you'll see jazz again. Let's see. Excellent. Thanks, Manit, for being with us today and for a very good